Welcome to video three for week four. In this video and the following, I'm going to talk about an application of multiple integrals. And this is used in physics and engineering to describe the mass and moments of certain objects where we know the shape and the density of the objects. And I'll discuss what I mean by mo moments as we go along. So the situation is this. I have either an object in R3 or possibly an object in R2. And you might think that that's not a terribly useful thing since there aren't any objects in R2 that actually work in the physical universe, the physical universe being three-dimensional. But these things are referred to as laminas, or laminae if you prefer the more formal Latin plural. And when we think of an object in R2, we sort of think of it as a, a thin, uniformly thick thing that we don't really care about its height, but we can still sort of talk about it. So flat sheets, things cut out of flat sheets, those kind of objects. And often it's actually really nice to work in R2 to describe these things. So instead of just calculating volume as I've done before, I now want to consider having a density function. So if I have some object in R3, it can be perhaps more dense over on a certain side and less dense over on a certain side. There's some density function that tells me how the matter in the object is concentrated. And this can be also true for a lamina. It could be sort of heavier on this side and lighter over on this side. It can have a density function in R2 that describes how dense this flat sheet object is. Then to find the mass of an object, I can integrate over that object the density function multiplied by a differential of volume in the setup for my integral. So instead of integrating one as I did for volume, I now integrate density. And this density function is going to come along for the entirety of this video as we're calculating a bunch of other things to do with the physics and mechanics of these objects. So we're always, always assuming that any object in R3 or any object described as a lamina in R2 has some kind of density and that density describes the how the object is going to act. If it's denser in a certain portion of it, it's going to act in a different way if it's uniformly dense. Uh, this density determines the physics of the object. So that's how we calculate mass. Now I'm going to calculate something that's called a first moment. So these first moments, I'll do them first for a lamina in R2. These are going to be two quantities going to be labeled mx or my, and they're going to tell me roughly speaking, how the matter, how the density is distributed in the x or y directions. So for mass, I just integrated rho dA, rho being the density. For the first moment in x, I'm going to integrate y. For the first moment in y, I'm going to integrate x. And the idea for the distance out from the y-axis, I want to integrate the x distances. So for my, is going to be roughly speaking, how is the matter distributed out from the y-axis? So I need the x distances. If I want how is the matter distributed out from the x-axis, I want the y distances. The height is how far it is away from the x-axis. So that explains sort of why this is x, even though it's uh, integrating in y, because they're labeled by how far they are out from that axis. So these are called moments. The, the first moment is dis distribution of the mass of this thing. I need the density there because the density tells me about this distribution. Then if I take the moments and scale them by the mass, I'm going to get coordinates x bar and y bar. What these coordinates are, are these are the coordinates of the center of mass of the object. So I have a lamina like this and say I get x bar y bar to be this point here, that means that this point is the center of mass of the object. So if I acted on this object with some kind of force, then in some ways it acts like a point mass at its center of mass. Alternatively, if you think of this as a sheet, then you could balance it at this point. If you were able to sort of sit this exactly on top of a, a, a stick or something at this point, then it would balance there, whereas if you stick it on top of another point, it's going to tip over. The center of mass is sort of also the balance point of this two-dimensional lamina object. I need to divide by the mass to get that scaling. So these moments tell me sort of how things are distributed, and dividing by the mass gives me the coordinates of the center of mass, the coordinates of this balance point for this lamina. That also works in 
R3. So if I have a region in R3 with a density function, here are its first moments. These are labeled slightly differently. This YZ is, I think of that as the distribution of mass out from the YZ plane. So I think about the YZ plane as this plane here. Then how far am I out from the YZ plane? Well, that is exactly the X coordinate. The X coordinate is the distance away from the YZ plane. So that explains this labeling of these first moments. The distance out in the Y coordinate, so the distance from the XZ plane. The distance in the Z coordinate is the distance from the XY plane. And these again are integrals of a variable times the density. Uh, these should be volumes because this is an R3. And then similarly, if I divide by the mass, I get three coordinates. And these three coordinates are going to be the coordinates of the center of mass of that object. So you, for some physics situations, can treat an object as a point mass as it, at its center of mass for something like the action of gravity or electromagnetic forces that are far away. If you manage to also push directly at the center of mass, you're not going to cause any rotational motion. Whereas if you push away from the center of mass, there's going to be a torque depending on the distance way that you're pushing the object will create rotation in addition to linear acceleration. Those are first moments. They describe the distribution of mass. They give us the center of mass. I also want to describe second moments. I'll do this again starting in R2 for a lamina. So second moments are very, very similar, but now I integrate the square of the variable. So this is now the distribution of the mass squared, uh, or the, the distance squared of infinitesimal pieces of mass. And instead of just telling us sort of how the objects balance, this is what we need to know to see how the object rotates. So this is going to be called Ix, this is going to be called Iy. If I have a lamina, some, some sheet here with some density in R2, then these things are the resistance to rotation around a certain axis. So Ix is the difficulty of rotating this thing around the x-axis, and Iy is the difficulty of rotating this thing around the y-axis. And the general idea here is that if the mass is distributed far away from the axis, if something is way, very far out, it takes a lot more force to start it rotating than if it's very, very close into the axis. So we, if this distribution, if these squares are very large, then I get a very, very large impediment to trying to rotate this thing around a given axis. I also have something called I0, which for a lamina is the resistance to rotating it around the origin in R2, or if you sort of embed it into R3 around the z-axis. So how difficult is, is it to spin this way? And that's given by, in fact, the sum of these two things. I have coordinates here like the center of mass. These are not exactly the same thing in the sense that the object's not going to act like an object at these coordinates. But what this tells me is I can define a coordinate x double bar. This is called the radius of gyration. It's f given by its square is given by the moment of inertia, the second moment divided by the mass. And then if I square root this, I can get x bar will be the square root of this term. And it tells me that the object for rotation around the x-axis is going to act like a point mass at radius x double bar. So it gives me a radius as th that says if all of the mass were concentrated at this radius, it would be equally as difficult to rotate. So it's not quite as precise or not quite as easy to see as the center of mass balance point, but it does still have that flavor of if you sort of crush this thing all down to a single point with the same mass, well, that point would have to be a certain radius away to have the same resistance to motion around the x-axis, and that radius is different for rotation around the y-axis or rotation around the origin. And because these things are squared, what I got to get out of this is x double bar squared. If I want x double bar or y double bar or r double bar, I have to take these second moments divided by mass and then square root them to get those distances. I have second moments in R3 as well. So the resistance to rotation around the x-axis is given by the integral of y squared plus z squared around the y-axis, around the z-axis. And again, I also have radii of gyration that tells me what distance away from the axis this object would act like if it were a point mass. Those are the concepts that I want to talk about for the rest of the week. Uh, I'm going to do an initial video where I do a bunch of example calculations, but that will be the next video.